so I don't have slides, you guys. That's fine, right? Right. Because slides are boring. And okay. right. So, pardon? That's the yeah. only slide on the planet that exists. If I could put one slide up for this talk, it would be the very surprised looking cat. So pretend the slide of the very surprised looking cat is behind us, the startled cat, because we're gonna be talking about complications in a way that we are not discussing them with our doctor, because complications are always presented as something that we get when we've done all the bad things and we've earned them for being horrible people, right? That part sucks, and that is the thing that I want to get away from here. So we're going to be talking about not just complications and screening for them and the importance of managing a diagnosis and that sort of thing, but the emotions attached to this sort of diagnosis or even the, the threat of this sort of diagnosis. Is everybody comfortable with that? Yeah. So we're going to get very like emotional and touchy-feely, and everybody's got to talk, especially you. Is it on? Is it not working? Oh, is there a room mic? Yeah. Oh, geez, we're going to, so I've got a CGM, a pump, and two microphones. Awesome. Right. Going to be lots of feedback. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Oh. Is there a seat or two? Guys, are going to be way up here. Okay. You still have to talk, though, even though you're way up here. All right. Are you guys ready? Yeah, ready. Are you excited? Yes. Go complications, right? This is, yay. Okay. So, um, so I want to get kind of a feel in the room for people who have had complications presented to them in a way that's scary. Why is not every hand in this place going up? Like when your doctor talks to you about complications, is it, oh, well, here's something that may happen, but we're working towards it not happening? Or is it more of a, here's what's going to happen if you don't take care of yourself and you're a terrible person and just go hide under this rock until you're dead? <laughs> that's kind of dark, but I feel like they're always presented in a way that's very tough and challenging and not in a way that we can easily talk about. Yeah. Oh, uh, my endocrinologist said to me, you have a 50% chance of dying of a heart attack if you don't take care of yourself. <laughs> when I was first diagnosed as a diabetic. And he has a 100% chance of getting punched in the face if he says it to you again, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that fear never left me, and uh, that's not fair. No. Because it's made, there's, in addition to the complications themselves, they bake this guilt into the whole thing. And that is super unfair. And it makes it tough for us to even want to go and get screened for these sorts of things when we're, we're supposed to feel bad about ourselves in the first place. Has anyone else had a similar experience? On the floor with the blue. Oh, it's you. Hi. I was told that I would live until I'm 30, and then I got pregnant. And they said either me or my baby's going to die, and I need to choose which one I want to keep. How old are you? I was 17 at the time mm -hmm. in Texas. And you're here somehow. I'm here at <laughs> 17 and doing wonderful. Yeah. Yay. How about, yes, please. Um, I kind of had another similar experience, but I went through a miscarriage. In I'm sorry. Few months, and during the DNC, he was telling me, well, you weren't going to have the kid anyway because you're diabetic. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh. Oh. And if I was more coherent, I probably would have kicked him. But yeah. I was mm -hmm. kind of in a state of myself. Yeah. So what did you do? Um, I was too young. I was young. Yeah. I didn't say anything. I but I ended up having a child. But it was seven years after mm -hmm. after another miscarriage. Is this doctor local? He used to be. Could people ask me questions? Stand so we can oh, hear them better. Yeah. Or just <laughs> everyone but you has to stand. You don't have to stand. Mic so we can all hear the questions. Sure, I'm here to run, guys. Do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> want to talk into the mic? I was I was just saying that. Um, Back when I was 21, I had a miscarriage at two months, and the doctor that was doing the DNC in his office in Del Mar, that used to be my husband's doctor years ago, but he's probably retired and gone, who knows. And he told me that, um, well, you wouldn't have had this child anyway because you're a diabetic, so you probably won't have kids mm -hmm. while well, he was doing the DNC, so. Yeah, but I now have a 26, almost 27-year-old. He's married, and he's great, so mm -hmm. I've been blessed with a child. So. And as I told the last group when they were talking about doctors that did things like that, that I have a 10-month-old at home, so if you just give me an address, I have a lot of used diapers, I'm happy to FedEx out to whatever office is most in you know, need of receiving them. Please. Um, um, I went with my wife to the doctor when we were still engaged, and the doctor kept me back after the visit and said, are you sure you want to marry her? Oh. Because are you his wife? Yeah. Was 46, he sure? 46 years tomorrow. So you're pretty sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My goodness. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. How about over here? Anybody have anything? That's cold. No? Everyone else has had 
diabetes presented, all the conversations you have with your doctors are extremely forward-facing and happy, and everyone feels really good when they leave the office? <laughs> Awfully quiet. To begin with, you're Pardon? Told to begin with, well, for me, it was one of those I was told that, you know, by the time I'm 20, 25, I wouldn't have any, you know, my mm -hmm. eyesight would start failing. Um, my toes would start, you know, things would start going on, kidney disease, yep. you know, I was told the whole smear, you know, and then when I turned 20, I was still able to see no damage in my eyes, and mm -hmm. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to be around a while longer, mm -hmm. I've had two kids now, and yeah. everything's great. Did you want to? Well, yeah, um, both my wife and my son have type 1, my, our, my son has had type 1 for 43 years. He's 45. He's doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, what my wife has had over 17. When she first saw a couple of doctors, not so, you know, like 16 years ago <coughs> or so, they said, uh, the doctor said, oh, you've got to be type 2. No, you can't. Be. You're, you're type 2. You're, in a, you're, you're this age, you're mm -hmm. type 2. The other frustration we had going back many years is that we often found that we know, know more about diabetes than mm -hmm. the doctors yes. did. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons for that is diabetes is so hugely a management problem rather for the person with diabetes mm -hmm. rather than a medical problem in the immediate situation that you're dealing with. But those were a couple of the frustrations we had. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No problem. Are you good? Are you good? Yeah. I am good. Hi. I think I speak loud enough anyway that I could be in the next room and people would hear me. <laughs> Um, my experience is different. Mine was a positive experience. Oh, good. Um, I was, like his wife, one of those misdiagnosed <laughs> type 2s who becomes a type 1 eventually, mm -hmm. um, or gets labeled as type 1 mm -hmm. eventually. And um, when I went to see the head of endocrinology at Kaiser at the time, um, he, we talked and he said, you're doing really well. You give you gold stars on your charts, if you all remember those charts you have mm -hmm. to keep. And um, I said, but, and then he looked at me and he said, but I can see that it's not about that. It's, you're scared about something. Mm -hmm. And he sat down in front of me, got in my face, and I still cry when I say this. He said to me, you're scared of something. What are you scared of? Tell me about it. And I said, my uncle lost both legs, went blind, and died of kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, the world has changed. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be like that for you. Mm -hmm. Did you, you want to say something? Yeah. Go for it. Sure. Um, I, um, I had a different kind of experience at Kaiser. Um, I was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a more standard experience. I, w I was... Um, um, really, um, like a monk with diabetes when I when I when I got it in, in my late teens, and spent ten years being <coughs> very austere and following every regime that was possible. Mm -hmm. This is in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Ten years with diabetes and not having had any complications. And like this lady, I had a family member who had had amputation, I had a family member who had died from diabetes in the 30s. Um, so there was a, a lot of fear about it, figuring stay, stay the track, mm -hmm. do what you're supposed to do. So I don't have any complications. I can see my extremities, I, I feel. And the, the doctor looks at me and says, you know, you've done very well the first 10 years. But the severe complications set in the next ten years. Ah. <laughs> so, so this is where things get a tiny bit tricky because it's it's easy to talk about complications in a way that's like, but it's not me, and it won't be me, right? And it's really easy to approach something like this with that sort of mindset. But it is me. I have diabetes complications. I have retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. And I feel like when you say it out loud, people, oh, but you're not supposed to. You have a microphone, right? Like, doesn't it seem like you're not supposed to have complications? I'm supposed to know better. And that's where it gets a little unfair. So sometimes a diagnosis of a complication, we get that, and then we don't know how to deal with the aftermath of it because we're shamed into thinking that it's something that we did wrong, that we're bad people, that we don't deserve, I don't know, good things and warm reception and support in dealing with this new diagnosis. So is there anyone here who would feel comfortable talking about any complications that they have since I've just gone and outed myself? I will. Let me run back here and then we'll just throw this at you and you can catch it. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, I had retinopathy after my son was born and mm -hmm. almost lost my vision and 
I had the laser surgery and I go to my doctor every year and my son's 23 now so I feel like I was lucky mm -hmm. but it was it was really scary because mm -hmm. I, I didn't expect it happened very fast so that's yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said it because now I feel like I'm not the only one so I feel a little like whoo it's like the first person who curses in this room takes the heat off of me because then I'm not the first one do you want to Pardon? <laughs> Do you want to, um, I don't know how to like get the microphone to you. So can you catch? Because I cannot. Nice, guys. Hi. Um, so I had diabetes for 37 years. And nice. after about 20 years, um, I was getting my master's degree. And I decided to not see the ophthalmologist. I didn't need to see him. My eyes were fine. Mm -hmm. um, worst idea ever. Um, so I got diabetic retinopathy. When they found it, my eyes were exploding. Um, and I actually lost vision in both my eyes at one time by crying, sorry. It's okay. It was the worst experience of my life. Um, had uh, six vitrectomies. I've had glaucoma surgeries, cataracts. I've been told that I'm never going to see again. My husband and I had, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. um, in my career, it was a big thing. Um, I fought back. I fought mm -hmm. back and I fought back and I fought back. And um, my husband kept telling me, gonna be okay we'll figure it out mm -hmm. um, I do have no peripheral I can't see at night mm -hmm. but I have a career I see 2020 and I just kept fighting and I'm now hyper vigilant I'm like Dexcom is my my thing I, huh. you know but I have it and I'm very embarrassed about it um, I'm embarrassed, okay, embarrassed. Able to work. yeah um, I'm scared because I have no peripheral so I can bump into people I look like I'd laugh it off but it's hard it's mm -hmm. really hard as a professional trying to get through um, but I have two kids and nine and two and they're wonderful. My hemoglobin A1C has been below six for like seven years and I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm. But it's because of that. We mm -hmm. lost that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's okay. And I'm on the other side. And I've got a husband who <coughs> is my driver at night and works with me. So, and but, I love thanks. you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Do you want to use it? Sure. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> The part that makes me a little nervous is the quickness of things sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I'm sitting at the computer and all of a sudden there's this ink blot mm -hmm. in my left eye. And I'm thinking, <coughs> okay, I'll call the doc. I'm, it's it's uh, it's Tuesday. No, I don't. Know, it's Thursday. It's Thursday. Okay, I can come in on Monday mm -hmm. early first thing early Monday. So I'm driving. That ink blot turns into a uh, I don't know, <coughs> buzzing, buzzing little bugs or a big sand blob. And I'm thinking, okay, it's evolved a little bit. Now I'm at dinner. And I, I said, I'm going to check my vision. So I cover my right eye and I can't see the expression on faces across the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in, I went in the next day, mm -hmm. 7.30. And uh, I, I made the appointment for a week later for my uh, my laser surgery is still coming up but uh, he gave me a shot and uh, a shot in the eye <coughs> I'm sure some of you guys have had shots in the eye and uh, it's when my ophthalmologist says you make me nervous I said you're not getting a needle in your eye <laughs> uh, so anyway so I'm, I, I'm thankful that I've had 48 great years mm -hmm. but Mm. Things happen quick. Yeah. Things happen quick. So, anyways, mm -hmm. that's just. You guys are so close to each other to have not hugged one another by this point is weird to me. <laughs> so, you're hiding in the corner. You want to say something? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> but so you saying that is brave. Dealing with it is brave. Saying that you mm -hmm. felt ashamed breaks my heart because that's the kind mm -hmm. of stuff that makes us not go get checked because we're afraid of what they might say. You know, and finding out and doing what you can to you know manage it is kind of the the goal. So I'm glad both of you have have shared that. And is there is there anybody else that's feeling bold? Go for it. I think I think for me, at first I was funneled just through primary care internal medicine, mm -hmm. and then um, any which way. By the time I got to um, <coughs> endocrinology, and I fought to do that way back when, they said you're three years from a kidney transplant, mm -hmm. and it was really you know quite late stages or whatever but then they just started powering on you know all the ace all the inhibitor all the medications this and that got me on a pump right away mm -hmm. and it now all these years later 
you know, very, followed very rigorously, and I have quite a few complications, but um, I, I'm like almost back, you know, to, I feel, in the normal range, mm -hmm. but with lots of following and yep. diligence, and I've had both eyes and laser treatments and retinopathy mm -hmm. and bleeding that just kept continuing. And, but, and I do think a lot of it is waking up every day with a clean slate and a great attitude mm -hmm. and being cheerful about it and embracing every moment and not letting it take you, but you take, you just live your life. Mm -hmm. and, um, anyway, so I'm grateful just for the fact of our, the things they can do. Like I, my, I wouldn't quit bleeding lately and, and, and I was terrified and I went to some other doctor and, and cause I thought I could still lose my vision, mm -hmm. you know, that's what we hear. But then my guy said, really you don't, if you come every, all the time, you know, we'll be on top of it. This doesn't happen if you're always on top of it. And I think I believe him. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it still bleeds and I still get my spots and then it mm -hmm. dissipates and it's still there. But anyway, lots to be thankful for. Yeah. And, and what you say highlights something else. Yeah. The whole be diligent, be diligent, be diligent. There's a mental and emotional wear and tear on you if you're always being diligent. If it's not about diabetes and the complications related to it and the whole mess. And so one of the under-discussed complications <laughs> of diabetes is depression. And that's something that people don't think is part of the sleep because it's not something you can test on a, on a glucose meter sort of thing, but it's still extremely relevant to, irrelevant to this uh, to this community. Yes, please, do you want to well, no, mic it up? I haven't had any complications, but in reference to what you just said, like mm -hmm. for myself, I can't really ever get depressed because I realized that if it wasn't for insulin, I'd be dead. Mm -hmm. So I kind of realized it's like, you know, I shouldn't be alive, so mm -hmm. it's a pretty good thing. <laughs> I feel that way about cupcakes. Every time I see one, I'm like, I shouldn't eat that, but I mean, damn, I'm alive, like, so I should probably take advantage of that cupcake. Go for it. Um, uh, I have uh, developed gum disease. Mm -hmm. I'm a home stay mom. And, um, it brings a lot of shame. Well, I don't, I don't want to kiss my husband. And when I have to go every three months for checkups, I just, it's very hard to ask for the money because I feel like, it's not worth it, but then again, I have to set up my mind to it is. I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. In the eyes of God, I'm worth a lot more than I can think right now, and I just have to get out of my mind and just go and fucking do it. She said it. She said the F word. Thank you. <laughs> We're done. Nothing else can be said because she said the F word. Can I? Uh, yes. You want to do this? I'll just right here. Thank you. So what I wanted to mention are the things, when you think of the huge complications, mm -hmm. I, I think that the things that I'm more aware of right now are the things that come along with being a diabetic, mm -hmm. like musculoskeletal mm -hmm. issues. Yep. And how that is, you know, daily too. And it's from, I've been told, from diabetes. So. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, that's that's a big one as well. Mm. Anybody else? Way in the back. This like quadrant has been quiet. <laughs> you've yes, you've got the mic. Do it. I have so many things that have happened over the years, but um, when I was first diagnosed, I was pregnant with my daughter no and had gestational, mm -hmm. and then after I had her, um, I started having problems with my eyes. Mm -hmm. and didn't know what was going on, so. You know, I went to the eye doctor thinking I needed glasses, and he said, oh my gosh, you need to go to your endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. And sent me upstairs to see the endocrinologist, and they did a blood sugar test on me. <coughs> and said, the doctor came in, and he handed me a box of Kleenex, and he said, well, you're diabetic. Uh, what, have, what have you been doing? <laughs> oh, jeez. Like, oh, what? <laughs> yeah. And basically walked out. Did he know he could have bypassed the Kleenex if he treated you nicer when he <laughs> delivered <laughs> Jesus? Yeah, so, and I've been diabetic for almost 30 years since mm -hmm. my daughter was born. And I've had so many different things. I had a, a heart attack, mm -hmm. and I have diabetic retinopathy, mm -hmm. and um, I've also had laser surgery, and the um, shots, I know how that feels. <laughs> and the doctor's like, you need to calm down. Yeah, right. <laughs> they don't offer a value. <laughs> yeah. Or a good 
scotch. <laughs> and, and I remember I was supposed to have this next laser surgery, and it was so painful when I got home. My eyes swelled up really big, and mm -hmm. I had to have my son come over and help me. And that's always demoralizing. Mm -hmm. um, and they never tell you that that's going to happen. They don't tell you, oh, we that doesn't usually happen. Mm -hmm. they said. So this the next time I was supposed to have a surgery, I called and I asked them if they could prescribe maybe Ativan for me or something. Sure. And the nurse like acted like I was being a big baby and she said, well, we never do that. And I said, well, can you check with the doctor and see yeah. if maybe they can, you know, he said no. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was yeah. just like, wow. But you know what? I'm doing really well and I feel like I'm healthier than most of the people I work with mm -hmm. when I see them. And they always, when they find out I'm diabetic, they go, wow. You look great. I mean, you eat so well. And mm -hmm. they, they don't know that you might be falling apart inside. <laughs> we make it look so you know, good. <laughs> yeah. And, but I mean, and I, and I know it's hard to say these things out loud. It's hard to share these stories. It's really humbling. But everybody that's sitting around you is there, yeah. either has gone through it, but everyone supports you in this room. This is the first time I've really been able to talk about that. Yeah. Who do you want to throw the microphone at? I know, I'm like, do we have one back here? Let's look at the baton of truth. Here you are, sir. Hi, everyone. Uh, I was uh, diagnosed just before I was 14 years old. And uh, the doctor who saw me in the hospital uh, said, Frank, if you take care of yourself, you can be, uh, you can live until you're 62. 62 <laughs> That's so specific. Yeah. <laughs> My father died when he was 51 and a half. I'm sorry. And um, uh, it, it, it really uh, uh, caused me to set, set a goal to outlive my father, which I've done. Mm. Uh, I'm going to be 77 in uh, August. <laughs> I've had a lot of complications over the years. Uh, uh, I, I have retinopathy. I've had thousands of laser treatments in both eyes. Uh, my left eye was operated on for some condition. I don't know what it was. But I, I and then uh, as somebody here sh shared a little while ago, I, I was blind in one eye uh, for a while, driving around, making left turns. I almost got hit a few times. And, oh, jeez. Uh, uh, fortunately, my, my something happened in one of my knees and I, uh, was after I was running and I, I went to the ER, the ER with not being able to see. and. Uh, the uh, ER physician sent me to an ophthalmologist mm -hmm. the next day and he, he fixed the, the blindness. But um, wow. I also have kidney disease, mm -hmm. I have heart disease. Uh, my current cardiologist talks a, a lot about inflammation, uh, which for those of you who don't know is uh, caused by high blood sugars. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and But what has helped me immensely is being involved in a couple of support groups. Mm -hmm. that have, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I've learned to laugh at myself more with uh, diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, not beat myself up so much, which I'm good at. Uh, and um, my, my family support has not been real good over the years. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I really go to the support groups uh, uh, for that. And um, I'm not, I'm, I don't mean to say that they're, they're, they're just let me go on my own and criticize mm -hmm. me all the time, but there has been some of that. And, uh, in, in my day, when I got it, you know, you couldn't eat cake, you couldn't eat ice cream, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't. And now, uh, I, I, I think I'd had diabetes about 52 years when uh, my primary care doctor, which I was seeing for my diabetes over the years, sent me to an endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. And that really changed uh, for me uh, a couple of years later because uh, she sent me to a diabetes educator mm -hmm. uh, who taught me about carb counting. And uh, now I, I feel I can eat anything I want. And, uh, you know, I don't always hit it on the mark, but I, I, I'm, I'm much, much more comfortable with my diabetes. That's enough of it. I just think it's great that you were talking about all the different things that you were dealing with, and then just casually you said, yeah, well, I was out running. I'm like, oh, all right. That's, so you're pretty badass. You ready? Yeah. You want it?
Uh, I think I'm okay. Uh, you know, I study, uh, I'm a retired academic, and part of my career was studying this, what I call the psychology of survival. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, interviewed people who were POWs in North Vietnam for over a decade, people who were in solitary confinement, people who were lost at sea for 60 some <coughs> days. All, and, but, but you know what? You guys, you beat them all in terms of the bravery, the courage, I mean, you know, thinking back to when I was a kid, you're all talking about stuff that people didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, people had can people had cancer. A doctor would tell the family members, but not the person who had it. You know, so people are now being open about things, and it benefits all the rest of us. And God bless you guys over there for sharing what you shared. You guys have had the safety of distance from me for the last <laughs> few minutes. Is there anyone back here who would like a microphone? No? Not I'll even? Talk. You keep making eye contact with me, so you're probably next, but you just pass it up to her when you're done. Good deal. Uh, I've been diabetic for 25 years, uh, and I kind of took a break from it for the last five. I've found out the hard way that that doesn't really work. Um, so with the support of my friends and family, I finally am doing it again. Um, this is the first diabetic conference I've been to. Oh, yay! And it's yay. the biggest wake-up call I've ever had, uh, even more than my incredibly high A1C. <laughs> so thank you is what I wanted to say uh, for sharing your truths and your stories. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. Nothing. Want to just grab it and pass it up? <laughs> you guys are good. No desire to chat into the microphone. No. Thank you for sharing. How about right back to you, Jen? How about you up here? Thanks. So I've, I've had diabetes for 24 years and uh, recently diagnosed with neuropathy. And my uh, my endocrinologist is surprised because he said, "Oh, well, if you're type one and in good control like I've been." you don't get neuropathy, but 10 to 5% of people with type 1 do develop it. He sent me to a neurologist because he's like, this doesn't make sense, but the neurologist was able to say, yeah, it's diabetes. Mm -hmm. And I had a type 1 person say, oh, you must be really brittle. You've been really in bad control. So I feel like kind of judged, and I feel like I'm a weirdo because I'm developing a, a complication that isn't a part of, a typical part of type 1. And just in hearing people, I, you know, vision, sure, and, you know, there are mm -hmm. no, So I've got, I'm prone to these, I guess, non-typical, and yet I know all these others are doing this. It's just, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I don't know yeah, if you're a weirdo or not, but if you are, it's not because of that. I don't, you know, <laughs> there's, um, and, and, but again, you said the embarrassment word. Yeah. Should she be embarrassed? No. Right, I, for real, no, not, not even a little bit, because saying this stuff out loud, it takes some of that shame off of you, and I hope you walk out of here leaving it here, you know what I mean? It's a fucking disease. There it is, the F word again. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't say it. Um, can I pass back to you, yes, and then we'll you. go to Jen, and then we'll go over here. Okay. Uh, mine is, fairly evident because um, using the scooter, I can walk, um, but I have such problems with my back uh, that I have to use this for long distances. I can walk around the house and stuff with a cane, but it's very evident and it's very embarrassing. And I find that most people just think I'm lazy. You know, they, they look at me in this thing and think, oh, she's just lazy. And uh, maybe I am. <laughs> but you said the word again. Should she be embarrassed? No. Right. Oh, no. Who vote? She be Anyone who votes yes gets thrown out actively. Do you always chuck it? No. Hello. Hi. So I was diagnosed in the late 80s. And um, I ended up going on the kidney transplant list when I was 13 because my diabetes was so advanced. And they said, you wouldn't get any complications until at least 10 years after you're diagnosed. And even longer than that, if you're lucky and you have good blood sugars and you eat the right thing. So I'm on the kidney transplant list and I'm terrified. I don't know what it is, but I just see the look in my mom's eyes. I just recently found out what my A1C was during that time. I'd probably be every single one of you in this room. I should not be alive. My A1C was 22. 
I don't know why God's kept me alive. He's got a sense of humor. <laughs> so dealing with kidney disease was very difficult. And I don't really know what happened to it, but I had my son and I had tests done after I had my son. My kidneys are fine, which is amazing. They're fully functioning. I test them all the time. <laughs> they work great. And the, the only other complications, well, the only other complications, I had a heart attack when I was 21. And people look at me, oh, you're fine, you're okay, you look healthy, just you know, go run. So I said and done. Um, but my eyesight, and that's, I mean, my kidneys can be shot and I'm okay with that and I'll work on it and work through it, but my eyesight, I was like, oh my God, God, please just let me be able to see this beautiful world that we live in and the looks on people's faces and just enjoy life. Let me see my grandkids. And going to the eye doctor, I did it religiously. I did it every six months. Mm -hmm. And my one eye doctor said, it's time to go see a retina specialist. I went, saw a retina specialist. I had three eye surgeries during the four years. And if it wasn't for them taking great care of me, if it wasn't for my diligence in going to the doctor, I would be completely blind. And it's just, it's so frustrating to, to hear how other people treat us. Mm -hmm. And it pisses me off, you know? We deserve better than that. We're a hell of a lot stronger than they are. <laughs> Tell them to give themselves a little three times a day and see how they feel. But we're troopers, we're warriors, we're, we're getting through this. And with the help of people like Carrie and <laughs> Dr. Edelman, we laugh about it a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, who is, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, stretch. There we go. I hope you don't mind me coming from a type three perspective, but first of all, I want to echo what he said, and that is that um, I saw my kids, two type one diabetic children, um, thank you for perseverance, mm -hmm. because that's what it takes, right? Mm -hmm. And I also want to say, my, I guess, how do I say this? I call it the good from the garbage, okay? So you see the, the depth of character and the, and the perseverance that has had to happen for you guys to get this far, right? Um, I have a 27-year-old and a 22-year-old that were diagnosed in their teens, and I, my middle daughter got through so far. Um, but it was when my son was diagnosed, and then uh, three years later, my youngest was diagnosed, daughter. Um, that was, they were the most argumentative of my three kids, the oldest and the youngest. That was what bonded them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I call it the good from the garbage, you know? And one of them forgot their, we call it the drugs, you know, forgot their drugs and we're out at a restaurant, I'm like, can they use some of your drugs, you know? And, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And just, um, so they, in some respect, they had a blessing because they had somebody else to go through it with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just, I'm, I'm grateful for their perseverance and yours and your willingness to share. So, thank you. Somebody else? But that's, I, that's a really good point because sometimes the complications that we talk about are always the like the shitty ones. And that's, mm -hmm. it's tough to focus on those all the time. But that, that bond, like the mother-daughter bond that my mother and I have because she's yelled at me, not about boyfriends that I had or whether I was late for curfew, but more like, what was your blood sugar? Like those battles somehow bonded us in a way that my brother and sister just are remiss in enjoying. So, <laughs> but like that's a strange complication, the closeness that we have with people that we do not know, but yet we know, you know what I mean? That's, that's kind of a lovely complication. And the fact that you guys are all sharing these different things that are super humbling and super intimate and really difficult to say out loud, that you're not the only ones to know that you're not the only ones, that's kind of cool too, right? Yeah. Um, I have type one and all three of my children have type one. Whoa. And all three, um, two of them got it before I got it. And then my son, who was in the DPT one, mm -hmm and then he eventually got it. But we were sort of really blessed when they were really young because we had really fantastic physicians. And then our physicians moved away to Stanford, Dr. Buckingham and his wife. And so then we went to every single endocrinologist in Orange County. We just kept firing them. And I heard 
I heard other people say this, and I think this is the real blessing, is that if you really have a physician who isn't good for you, just ditch them and move on. Just fire them, because life's too short, and because we had such a good start, you know, good start, I never really um, had a real, uh, I were hopeful. Hopeful, enjoying life, you know, doing the best we could do. Knowing that, you know, and, and th these complications, you can be, you know, just whatever you read, you can be perfect, although none of us are perfect. But um, you can be perfect doesn't mean you're not going to get the complications. You know, just take each day. So anyway, I just want to encourage you that if you're not getting good care or supportive care, fire them. Fire their butts and get on to somebody else. I'm going to sound like a, a whiny baby because I don't have any serious complications. I think for me, and I've been diabetic for 22 years, it's the little things. Mm -hmm. It's like the frozen shoulder mm -hmm. that I've started talking to people who have just dealt with that. Where, you know, it's just like you go to the doctor because something's wrong. It's like, oh, well, your diabetic has a frozen shoulder. Mm -hmm. It's diabetic. And it's like, what? Yeah. And stress factors. And it's the little things um, that it's just kind of like a constant kick in the gut. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. You don't sound like a whiny baby, you sound like a human being. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. This has been awesome. What do you mind explaining? Um, I think for the, the woman who had the retinopathy and thought she was always being so good, I always thought I was being really good and my sugars were not that bad. And it was recommended that I get a pump and I thought, no, I'm fine. So they put a, a continuous glucose monitor on me for a few days. And when I would check my sugar, it was here, it was here, it was maybe here and here, no big deal. But when they put me on the continuous glucose monitor, my sugars were like this. Mm -hmm. We don't know that because we catch this moment in time and this moment in time and this moment in time and we think it's fine. Mm -hmm. But the diabetes really messes with you. So <laughs> even though you think you're under pretty good control if you're not on a pump or, and, and you see these sugars and it seems fine, that's where it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's all that stuff in between that you don't see. So anyway. I have a little different perspective. Shoot. I became diabetic at age 50, instantly. Agent Orange, be Vietnam. I went to the VA three years later and was instantly told by the CDE and the doctor that uh, CGM is too much information. You just need to be shooting the NPH and the Lantus and move on. Stick with this. I argued. She told me to take a hike. So I went out and got a CGM myself. <laughs> and I think Dr. Edelman would agree. I was my own advocate. Mm -hmm. right. I had to fight it. And I think all of us need to realize that we are in charge of our bodies. Mm -hmm. We are our own advocates. You need to make your own choices mm -hmm. on who you're going to work with. And I work at the VA. Now, it's okay. I'm, I have a sick tandem pump, and they don't service tandems. But they finally got Dexcoms. Mm -hmm. And she finally prescribed it for me. Ten years after that. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just saying, I am my advocate now. Mm -hmm. I listen to the doctor, but I also have an opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to? All right, see. <laughs> Sorry for your face that I got really close to, Lady of the Ends. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I have a, not a personal story, but a story that relates to this conversation. Um, so there, for many decades in the, in the 20th century, there was a debate whether or not complications was um, something that individual patients could control with good control or whether it was just a genetic fluke. Uh, it was just a roll of the dice. And so in 1983-84, and Dr. Edelman remembers this, they had this huge study. The, the initials were DCCT, Diabetes Control and Complications Study. I, and it was very simple. You had two big groups across the country. One group was with intensive therapy, 
and one group was the control group. And it was just to determine whether could intensive therapy um, reduce the risk of complications. I was actually interviewed to, to be in, in, the, in the trial. I was in school at the time, but for various reasons, I didn't make the cut. Um, so, so, but I, I, of course, followed it. And what they discovered, it didn't even take them 10 years to discover that with intensive therapy, you could indeed reduce complications. It was particularly microvascular. It was, it was eye and, and kidney. And so the results of this were announced and heralded with tremendous enthusiasm because it proved that indeed with good control, you could reduce your risk of complications. And so there was, it was huge celebration. But what they did not announce when they, um, when they disclosed this was what the intensive therapy group individuals received. They all had essentially their own um, nurses and doctors and investigators calling them on the phone, bringing them into the clinic. They gave them baseball tickets. They had them over for dinner. It was all to make sure that the intensive group had much lower A1Cs than, than the, uh, the uh, non-intensive group, than the, than the control group. So really, and I'd be curious your thoughts, that I mean, in, in a way, this disclosure and this trial was kind of a mixed blessing for us because it, it told everyone, it told the wider world that you're responsible for your own history or for your own fate, but it didn't tell the world what you had to do to actually achieve that <laughs> result so that now people feel blame. Well, well, you know, why, you know, or as one, one person once told me, this is a, a bit morbid, but she said, well, like, have you ever been to a funeral for someone who had, who had died? And someone says, well, Joe ate too many cupcakes, mm -hmm. you know, and so, and so um, it's really, it's up to the doctors, I think, and the, and the thought leaders to kind of communicate just how difficult it is to, um, to, you know, to, to get good results. I, I gave my husband permission to hit somebody in the face if they ever said that at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> she just yeah. doesn't take care of Here's the mic. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. And uh, what I said this morning was uh, what came out after that study was basically why I started TCOID. Mm -hmm. right. Things weren't happening enough. Okay, there's some room here I want to make a comment. I'm going to speak out early, get ready for our debate. Let you guys finish up. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I feel sorry for your brother. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if I pass back to you real quick? Go for and then, it. Okay. And just to like speak for that, you really do have to be your own advocate. Like right. my dad taught me, he has a lot of autoimmune issues. Like, don't give up with the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Humalog did not work for me the same mm -hmm. way Novolog does. And my insurance, I got a call. Nope, we don't cover Novolog anymore. I said, well, that's not gonna work. I've been mm -hmm. on Novolog for ten years. And I went to my doctor and I said, I need a new script. I need a prior off. She's like this has only worked for like one other person. I was like, no, it's gonna work. Like, I want Novolog. And with, you know, the insurance covered it. And the same thing, I wanted to switch pumps. Like, they expect you to just give up. Mm -hmm. Like, don't give up, and you'll get what you need, but you really have to be your own advocate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so my timer's gonna go off. There it goes. Uh -huh. Here you go, wait. Oh. We have two minutes, so like, the be poignant. Use the mic. Yeah. Put your face near. <laughs> of diabetes is so tremendous. So we don't blame asthma patients because I also case manage patients. So asthma patient, patients don't get blamed. You know, if they have an asthma attack, uh, we don't tell cancer patient, oh, you didn't take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. But as diabetics, we have this burden, this other emotional burden of people like blaming us mm -hmm. if you get a, compl or a complication. So my uh, cousin died of heart disease at 40 something, and my other cousin says to me, well, he didn't take care of himself, his diabetes. And that's what we're left with. Mm -hmm. And I think that when people were saying be ambassador and be an advocate, this is a disease, you know? And I think um, it's important. Um, that we all don't take that the further huge burden of uh, guilt and shame that we don't deserve. So, thank you. For no, thanks for saying that. Because that's that's the note that we should be ending on. That like the E word, the embarrassment. Nope. And then all this stuff about I don't know, feeling like we're less than or judged or nope. Huge nopes to all of these sorts of things. This is a moment of empowerment where we're supposed to be 
cool with all that we're handed and know that we can deal with whatever comes our way. And so the way that we're going to end this, you know that bit in church where everybody does the peace piece and everybody pieces? Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to peace. So if you haven't met the people, if, you have, if you've come alone and you haven't met anybody yet or you're looking to connect with people at this conference, you are sitting in a room full of people just like you. So now is a good time to do the peace, peace, peace thing and meet the people sitting around you, make some connections, because why else did you come here? So please do that now. And thank you guys very much for being so candid. Thank you. Thank you.